It's time to continue on our series into conversations with Christ. These were encounters that Christ had in the New Testament with individuals or with people and where he brought revelation to them, revelation of who he was, revelation of the kingdom of heaven, revelation even of their hearts and what their heart condition was and changed those individuals remarkably uh, for the rest of their lives and even really speaks to us as New Testament believers and, and gives us guidance and gives us hope and gives us faith uh, to believe in God more. Um, this this conversation with Christ was subtitled, Jesus Met Two Men on the Road to Nowhere. Um, this is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, 31 to 32. Um, this account is only actually recorded in the book of Luke. Uh, Luke was the famous historian who, um, he was a doctor, but he was a historian of the top degree uh, because he went around and he spoke to eyewitnesses he didn't see many of the things that happened but he went around and he spoke to everyone involved uh, in the life of Jesus and everyone who went, witnessed his ministry he got accounts of things he wrote them down recorded them uh, for Theophilus um, and here he's gone and he's found these two disciples and as he's gone through the, each of the disciples he found these two and he spoke to them and they said oh would you hear what happened and they told him the story and he's recorded it really for our blessing uh, and for our encouragement. Uh, the road to, to nowhere is really the road to Emmaus. This is the only time in Scripture this road is mentioned. Uh, it's not mentioned anywhere else in Scripture. You find that, the, the, that Jerusalem was the heart of where everything was happening. Here is where Jesus was crucified, where the church was, was at this time. Um, this is really the hub, hub, hubbub and the central focus of the church. And these men were walking away from the things of God. They were walking away from the center of where everything was happening. And they were heading on the road to nowhere, the road to Emmaus. And they were walking away and dejected and all the rest. This was incidentally t recorded the, the very, or happened the very same day that the, the, the ladies or the women found the, the tomb of Jesus empty. And the disciples had ran to the tomb to check themselves. So this was the very same day. And it actually says that. Um, and verse 13, now behold, two men, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus. So here they found that the tomb was empty and that Jesus had risen from the dead. And the women recorded, uh, uh, recounted the story of how they encountered the angels. And that same day, rather than spending time looking for Jesus' body, rather than spending time with the other disciples, um, rather than than staying where they were to find out what was happening they had walked away they had traveled down this road to Emmaus as I said there may be a fact one of them at least was probably from this area because they went to a house in Emmaus now the journey is about seven miles it's records in scripture um, seven miles really take you anywhere from two to three hours depending on how fast you're walking and how much effort you're putting into it but if these two men were, were walking along and talking it actually says that they were talking and reasoning with, with each other and they're talking about everything that had happened it, it probably I would push it out to the three hours they weren't uh, uh, weren't in any rush these guys weren't out doing uh, clocking it up counting their steps or anything they got there they were literally walking down the road ambling down the road and talking about the things that had happened um, instead of searching for the body of Christ instead of spending time with the disciples you know uh, and it says in verse 15 it says while they conversed and reasoned Jesus drew near and went with them you know it's ironic you know those last days the last day really whenever Jesus was arrested and when he was put on trial when everyone abandoned him when he was left to his own devices and he was left alone and all the disciples really forsook him uh, and left him that that here these disciples had even left Jerusalem and they had gone away and yet it says and yet Jesus drew near and walked with them that's really the heart of Jesus, isn't it? To come alongside those who are his, to come alongside those who are confused and distressed, to be there and to be available. It says, while they conversed and reasoned, Jesus drew near and went with them. It's a wonderful picture of the believer's life. Jesus who comes along uh, to each of us, he draws near to us and we recognize our need of him. And then he walks with us by his Holy Spirit for the rest of our lives. He walks with us and he's with us. We're never alone. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. So as these two men walked on, they chatted and Jesus said, what kind of conversation is this? 
that you walk and are sad. He noticed from their demeanor and from their conversation that they were they were sad. Something had happened. And they were actually quite shocked by this. They were a wee bit surprised by this. And they asked him, are you only just come to Jerusalem? Have you not been here? Do you not know what has gone on? Uh, they they, cha- they almost, they not quite challenge him, but they're really just amazed. I mean, this was the buzz of the whole city. Everyone was talking about Jesus and about his betrayal. They were, first of all, they were talking about his, his preaching and his teaching and his miracles. And then now the conversation had changed until how he was crucified and how he was betrayed by one of his own, how the chief priests had conspired against him and how the Romans had crucified him and he had died. I mean, have you not heard this stuff that's going on? Have you not been aware of this? Uh, are you already new to Jerusalem that these things are a, a mystery to you? Now, the disciple actually who speaks is Cleophas, and he actually gives a great synopsis of Jesus' ministry. He talks about about who he is. There's a, a, a really an important message in what he says, uh, which in essence really becomes a foundational um, way of, of sharing one-on-one the gospel message. Really, whenever you look at this picture of what he shares with he's sharing with Jesus, but at this time he doesn't know it's Jesus. And he starts to tell Jesus about Jesus' life, about the life of Jesus and about the things he did. And really that's sharing your faith, isn't it? Really that's about being, uh, uh, you know, real about your rela- relationship with God. You can remember the, the lady who came to the church uh, a number of years ago and she talked about gossiping the gospel. And that's what these men were doing. Although they hadn't got a full gospel at this point, they were still talking about Jesus in the past tense uh, because they hadn't quite appreciated and understood that he actually had risen from the dead. Um, So they had a slightly limited view of the gospel at this point. But here they're sharing just what happened about Jesus. And there's a few things that are worth pointing out. They call Jesus a prophet. Realistically, until the time of John the Baptist, from Malachi to John the Baptist has been 400 years without a prophet in Israel. 400 years where generations had come and gone with no prophet, with no direct voice from God. All they had was the scriptures, was the Tanakh, the Old Testament. Maybe they, they, they also had, as they talk about the, uh, the daughter of the voice, the, the Ruach Adonai, the, 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 the small voice of God. But he never spoke to the entire nation. It wasn't a prophet like Malachi like Ezekiel, like Jeremiah, it wasn't a prophet like that. They were they they hadn't had a prophet like that in four hundred years, and yet there was something about Jesus's words and his ministry that he recognized, and he told them he was a prophet. So it has extra weight in it, bearing in mind the fact that they hadn't seen a prophet for generations. When he calls Jesus a prophet, there's extra weight there. There's extra emphasis there in his ministry. Uh, they had been without a prophet. For over 400 years, he talks about Jesus being mighty indeed, the deeds that he performed amongst the nation, the things that he had done, uh, the miracles uh, that he had performed, the deliverances of the, the people who were bound and the people who were possessed, the raising to life those who were dead. You know, think of Jairus's sick daughter. Think of the of Lazarus. Think of other things. People who had died, and Jesus had raised from the dead. People who had been sick, lame, who had leprosy. Those mighty deeds were were feeding the five thousand, feeding of the four thousand, over and over again. These mighty, mighty deeds that were performed in Israel. He also says that it, they also said that he was mighty in word. It would remind you of that uh, comment about Jesus that no man spake like this. His words brought revelation. They brought light. They brought a challenge to the religious establishment. They brought encouragement and hope to those who were hopeless. He was mighty in words. Words which even today speak to us, which for 2,000 years have spoken to the church, which have encouraged men and women, boys and girls in their faith, have have encouraged us to believe him, to trust him, and to hope for something better. What mighty words that he has indeed spoken. And Cleophas reminded us of that. He also goes on to talk talk about Jesus being betrayed and crucified. We had hoped 
is one of the key phrases here. We had hoped. See, his limited understanding of who Jesus was and what his ministry was had ended with his death on the cross and his burial in the tomb. We had hoped. There was a finality to it. There was an end to it. There was a, a death of hope. There was. We thought that he was the Messiah. We thought that he was the anointed one. We thought that he was the, the Christ, the one who would deliver Israel from a bondage and from slavery to uh, Rome. We had hoped. They were dejected, defeated, deflated and in denial. He wasn't the Messiah. He was just a prophet. What a, a sad end to, his, to this part of his conversation. He started so winsomely and so wonderfully talking about him being mighty in word and mighty in deed and being a prophet like no other we had seen for generations. And yet he ended without hope, deflated and dejected. And Jesus replies and he says to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe. And he said, it's noteworthy what Jesus said. And he says, Slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Then it says, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures and the things concerning himself. If you note in that wee small passage, in that, those verses, how many times he says all. You see, their religious leaders and their religious establishment, establishment, the rabbis and so on, what they had been teaching was about the Messiah who would come and deliver. They have been teaching about Mashiach ben David, the, the Messiah, the son of David, who would come and sit on the throne of David. And the whole nation was a hotbed ready for this triumphant conquering king who would arrive, this Messiah who would deliver him from oppression and return the glory days, the golden age of Israel. And that was what they had had. And that's, it was true. But they had only been reading certain scriptures certain passage they had been pushing the, the the deliverance aspect of Jesus ministry of the Messiah's ministry and it's important and that is true but they had forgotten to preach the suffering servant the Mashiach ben David, uh, ben Joseph ben Joseph the, the Messiah the son of Joseph Joseph the suffering servant who was betrayed by his brethren who was sold to his oppressors who was tortured, who was treated badly by his family. They didn't p paint the full picture of Jesus or the Messiah, who he was meant to be. They were happy with the king, the deliverer. But what about the Messiah from Isaiah, the suffering servant who was bruised for our iniquities, who was pierced, who was striped, who suffered for us? They totally didn't have that. That understanding, those scriptures and those teachings and those prophets were unknown to them. So Jesus took them back to the whole of scripture and gave them a full picture. He took looked at all the prophets and all the scriptures concerning the Messiah. And he brought them revelation, brought them an understanding which they had been lacking, which they hadn't appreciated. And so they had been taught in certain of the prophets and certain things but not a full picture of who the Messiah, the Christ, would be. This is really, for us as, as New Testament believers, this is the importance of preaching the full gospel message, the full message of the scriptures, because then we get a full picture of un understanding who Christ was and his ministry on this earth, a full understanding of God's heart towards lost humanity. It's only whenever we look at the full gamut of scripture that we understand who we are in Christ and how we should live in Christ and how we should go through this world. Without that, we can have a very twisted view. We can have one leg to stand on and hop through this life, expecting only deliverance and happiness and pure uh, joy and, and victory and victory and victory. But when you've got an understanding, a true understanding of the scriptures, we understand that it is because of our position in Christ that we can go through all of the things of this world. I mean, Christ went through the cross and in that moment of suffering, in that moment of tragedy, uh, apparently he was conquering death. He was going through it. He didn't avoid it. He won the victory by going through it. 
And we are reminded of the importance of, of the whole of Scripture and the whole of the New Testament and the whole of the Old Testament to understand his ministry. And he opened up the Scriptures to, the, to them. See, these men knew that the body of Jesus was missing, but they did not believe. They had heard the reports of the from the women who had been to the tomb and seen the angels. They didn't really believe them. They had heard from the, the first disciples who had run to the tomb and came back, but they didn't really believe them. They still doubted them. They said, yes, OK, the body's missing. Well, we'll accept that. But they didn't believe that he had risen from the dead. But here Jesus proved that faith in the resurrection comes not from seeing an empty tomb, but from believing in the scriptures. See, for us, we could run to Jerusalem today and we can have a look at what they apparently tell us was the tomb of Jesus. But is it the tomb of Jesus? Is it one of many and it's just a, a, a representation of it? Not everyone's going to have the advantage of going to see the empty tomb. Countless generations and 2,000 years have passed now and we haven't. I have never been to see an empty tomb. And yet I believe with all my heart in the resurrection because the Bible tells me so. And that's what Jesus is doing to these disciples as he's taking them through the scriptures, as he's revealing all the truth about himself that's contained in the Old Testament. As he's revealing that to them, he's teaching them that faith comes through the scriptures, not through seeing. Not through seeing an empty tomb or an apparent empty tomb that someone might have been the right one, might not be the right one. You'd always have those doubts if you're dependent on what you see. But if you're believing in the scriptures and what God has taught in the revealed word of God and the prophecies in the Old Testament that foretell it, if you're believing in the God of the miraculous and the God of the scriptures, then your faith will grow and grow and grow. And that's what he's teaching these disciples and he's teaching us today as well to have faith in him, not based on what we see, but I'm based on who he is and what the scriptures teach us about him. This entire story really is a reminder for us. When things go wrong, when disaster strikes, when our hope fails, when all hope is lost. His disciples said we hoped that he would be the Messiah. When they had searched and they thought that they had the answer, they had the plan, they had God's will, they had the deliverer. When they thought that, they had found that, that it wasn't right. They were uh, dejected and depressed and deflated. We can have that whenever we have hopes and dreams, when things in our lives and the call of God in our lives seem so real and so vibrant and we want to chase after these things. And we do pursue after them. And yet sometimes there's a knockback, there's a setback, there's a delay. Things happen and our hearts can be broken. Our spirits can be heavy within us. We can be dejected. We can be deflated. We can be depressed even. And just as Jesus took these dis disciples back to the scriptures, so too for us. It's important at those moments whenever we find ourselves uh, down and depressed and heartbroken and, and hopeless. It's important at those times that we return to the scriptures again. Where we renew our mind with the washing of the word of God. Where we bathe in God's word and we allow his Holy Spirit to, to put on the balm of Gilead. To build us up once again. To encourage us once again. To see that a setback isn't a denial. To see that a delay isn't the end of the road. To see that a closed door isn't necessarily the end of God's call or God's will for your life. That God has a way and can make a way where there is no way. That he is the God who can go before us making the rough place smooth and the crooked path straight. And as they returned to the scriptures, if Jesus led them back to the scriptures, they had hope once again. So too we can have hope once again when we return to the scriptures. The impact of this conversation on these men personally is significant and for us it is of utmost importance. 
The other part to note is the very end, verse 32, and it says, And they said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? The fire of God was once again rekindled. Those embers had been glowing. Uh, defeats, dejected, hopelessness had, had dampened down the fire, but there was still an ember there. And the scriptures, by, by Jesus opening the scriptures to them, uh, kindled once again a fire within them. There did not our hearts burn within us. So too in our situation, the Holy Spirit can open up the scriptures to us can once again light, relight a fire in our hearts that maybe has been dampened down, maybe that's been put out, but there's something still there. It reminds you of the, this, the echoes from Jeremiah 20 verse 9. And it, he said there, the prophet says, His word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. Oh, his word is so precious, so wonderful. These two men were on a road to nowhere and even though they, they continued on their path, you know what? These men were transformed. They were changed. Luke, coming to them many years later and asking them about these things, heard from them again, did not our hearts burn within us when he talked to us on the way? I pray that today, as you meditate on these words, as you meditate on these scriptures, as you think about Jesus and about what he's done in our lives, and who he is and where he's going to lead us. I pray that as we think on these things, that once again, that our hearts will burn within us. A passion and a love for him that cannot be quenched, that cannot be extinguished, that will burn all the brighter as the years go on. I pray that you're encouraged today. I pray that you're blessed today. I pray that hope once again leaps in your heart and that you believe that God is a good God and that he is able more than able to handle anything that comes your way. Praise the Lord and God bless.